For those of you who know the work of the Early Education Initiative, you probably know that we focus on birth through age eight. We put a lot of pride in the fact that we're really trying to cover the full spectrum of early childhood as understood by developmental science. And that includes the youngest years of children's lives, and we certainly have been talking about that here today, but also the years of kindergarten, first, second, and third grades. And I wanted to just put in a quick little note about how we see this work really connecting, the, these really important issues really connecting to that birth through eight strategy. The, the points about a birth through five financing system are incredibly important um, because there's such a difference in financing um, those teachers in the birth through five uh, age span. And what we're also recognizing is that if we really want to build that alignment all the way up through those grades of kindergarten, first, second, and third grade, the teachers themselves need to see themselves as on the same playing field, uh, in, in level with each other in terms of their compensation, in terms of the kinds of training that they've had to go through, in terms of the way that they've um, kind of absorbed a lot of the, the lessons we've learned from neuroscience and cognitive science and, and social science over the years. And to enable that kind of true alignment um, will take a, an increase in the compensation levels of our of our birth to five workforce. So that's one of the reasons why we really see this as a really critical component of that birth through age eight strategy. Okay, so let's jump into our discussion here today. Um, let me just quickly introduce everyone who's with us. So to my right is Carol Brunson Day, who's with, is on the govern, uh, president of the governing board for the National Association for the Education of Young Children and who many of you know as well um, through years of uh, fantastic work on behalf of children um, in, in many, in, in many uh, settings and uh, organizations. Jason Sachs at the Boston Public Schools, who's the director of early childhood there. Nancy, um, I'm sorry, I'm just now I'm just reading everybody's markers here. University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst, who can give us an economist perspective. And um, Joan Lombardi, who uh, many of us have been following um, for years and who is, is now a, um, a, a senior consultant with the Buffett Early Childhood Fund um, among among many international uh, consultancies as well. So thank you to you all for being here. What I want to do is start with Joan. Um, I want to ask you, Joan, if you could provide us a little bit more historical perspective. Um, despite policy changes over the years, and there have been quite a few policy changes over the years, and despite this incredible uh, wealth of research we now have on brain development, we are still grappling with this low wage, low status issue among our um, early learning, early care and education staff. Why? Well, thanks, Lisa. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here representing grandmothers um, <laughs> since they gave me the opening in the last panel. I, I really first want to congratulate the authors, all three of you, um, for once again giving voice to this issue. And that's what they're doing. They're giving voice to this issue. Um, I remember, I want to go back a little further than 25 years, I remember being out of a preschool classroom myself, it was 1979, I think, when I read Marcy White Book's expose <laughs> on who cares for the child care worker. And I want to particularly recognize her for her absolutely tireless effort and ask you to join me in thanking her. <laughs> Because it has been a really, really tough and long road. Um, I think that, you know, I went into the archives in my basement and pulled out the original report and many other reports that talked about this issue over the years. And there was a sentence that I wanted to share with you. It said, lack of attention to quality has its costs. Inattention, I think the word was, to uh, quality has its costs. And I think the findings, and the conclusions uh, in the report should open up everyone's eyes to the immediate need to focus on teachers as the heart of quality and the twin issues of supporting parents. And they're two sides of the same coin, and we have to remember that. It was pretty amazing to me to sit here this morning to remember that day back. I was reminiscing with the authors this morning when they walked into the room and there were all these cameras for the first time. Uh, hearing about this issue, and I'm um, almost hearing the same words that we heard today, 
um, and the same reactions that we heard today. Um, what's been interesting over the years, 20, 30, 40 years, and many of you have been with us on this journey, is that teachers have never really known how to talk about this. They were afraid to talk about it. They didn't know how to bring up their own compensation and their own working conditions. And I'm hoping that that changes as of today and that we go through a dialogue across the country of teachers talking about that, their, this issue and how it's affecting them. And I thought Ange, Angie was so articulate about this. And, and then parents talking about how it affects them. It's that two-way dialogue. The context today is so completely different. The expectations on teachers are amazing when I think of what we're asking them to do. Um, uh, but I think the other important thing that's different today, and before I get to your question, Lisa, is what Megan and Deborah pointed out, and that is that the science is, has taught us that this report today is about children. And let it be clear that this report today is about the well-being of children and the parents' ability to pay. It's also about fairness and justice, um, and we have to continue to talk about that, but I think in our figuring out our metaphors, we've got to continue to focus on the working conditions of, of uh, teachers are the living conditions of children, which was something we used to say years ago. Getting to your question, um, you know, I think the key issue has been said, it's financing. But it is, and, and you know, it is synchronicity that we have uh, the bill that passed last night, but let today be the beginning of a new campaign. Um, we're happy that that bill passed, and we're happy that it made important step forwards, but today is a new day, and I think it, the fact that this report came out, I'm getting old, I believe in signs, um, <laughs> and I think there is something about the fact that we need a new campaign around financing. Not only the n more, but how, what the sources of it is, new creative ways of thinking about the sources, how is it structured, and I think Miriam got to some of that, and what does it pay for? And we are going to have to have a big campaign, um, again, around this issue, and I'm hoping a new generation takes us forward on that campaign. You know, to me, there's been three issues that have caused this, us not to talk about financing. One, and all three of them have been said, one has been that, you know, child care is, you know, continues to be seen as a family responsibility, not a public good, that the history in the field has been a dichotomy between care and education, and I love that Anne started with care. I think the word care is important. Um, and third, this lack of understanding between the relationship of the working conditions and the well-being of children. And I think that's been, it's this science, it's the two-generation approach that brings it to it. I, I'll come back and say a few more words about the financing um, and, and what I think we need, but let me leave it there for okay, now. Thank you. So I have a question for all four of you, and maybe we'll just go down the row, and Carol, I can s start with you. Um, there is a place in the report where we, we see that Child care workers, as defined um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, those are the terms they use in this particular um, section, that their pay has only increased 1%. Um, preschool teachers, again, these are the words being used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, their pay has increased 15%. And we have this differ differentiation even in that one chart and that one graph um, between care and education. I want to ask you all why the dichotomy and what might this tell us about how policies should shift to enable not only higher compensation, but as we're all talking about here, um, better learning environments for children. The dichotomy, oh, excuse me. <coughs> The dichotomy that I see is it's historical. We have since certainly my time in this field, we've always had a dis discussion about the difference between care and education, uh, with care being seen at, by the general public in some ways almost more than by people who work within the, the field, but also by people who work within the field. 
as a form of um, making certain that young children are safe and uh, are cared for. Um, there was a time when we, when we inside the field resisted using the term education for um, providers or workers who are working with younger children because we thought that, that what that brought with it was um, a commitment to a restrictive, very highly structured mm -hmm. curriculum as teachers use in uh, elementary schools. Um, but I think over the years, while we have seen some uh, work, uh, in fact a good deal of work, to have us use terminology that is inclusive of care and education and promoting the concept that care and education really are one if done well. Care that's done well is equivalent in all ways to early childhood education done well. While we worked to make that happen, there is still a dichotomy. It still exists. Um, the language, and I took a look at the, I went to the occupational, um, what is it, occupational handbook that the Department of Labor puts out. And we have, each time that document has been revised, the profession is asked, what do you think of the two categories? Because the workers are divided into two categories. Mm -hmm. One are listed as early childhood educators. Those are the people who educate young children. And the other is the care category. Mm -hmm. And they make very clear distinctions about them. There it's care, people who care for, care for kids are service workers. Um, and so there's a real distinction made. We always have said, let's get rid of this distinction, but Department of Labor has uh, not been that responsive. So those two categories still exist. Um, what I am struck by is that the, while care is different from education, care and education are the same, or vice versa. Care and education are the same, but there is a difference between care and education. And it's really about the quality, um, and I'm gonna speak some more later about this whole issue of training and preparation mm -hmm. and how it affects what people do and how they perceive themselves as well as how we are perceived by policymakers and the general public. Jason, what about this, this dichotomy? Mm -hmm. and, and does it teach us anything in terms of whether pay might be able to be increased? Sure. So I think um, just looking historically, too, is that you have a health and human service model that was funding women to go to work, right? That was sort of the Republican argument. That's how Chris Dodd and, and Orrin Hatch got together, and that's how we, we got this stuff started, right? And so it was that willingness to, to sort of make that compromise. So that's one funding stream. It's a health and human service model that was really more around uh, workforce, not around educating or parenting. So that's, that's one history to this. Then I think the, the universal pre-K programs have um, since are new, newly funded, they're state generated, and those come with more of a degree requirement and the educational value of uh, selling for the student, the, closing the achievement gap. So I think it's sort of an intersection of those that have sort of created multiple funding streams um, that have influenced wages and categories. Now, um, the, the the way I, I guess I would say this, so I work at the Boston Public Schools. We have a union. Everything's negotiated by um, the union. Teachers are paid $70,000 a year. Ratios are negotiated by the union. Um, all our teachers start with a bachelor's degree, have to have a master's degree within five years. Um, and we'll talk more about training, but I just, even on that end, I can tell you that we have to spend a tremendous amount of time doing professional development um, and really getting this right. This is very complex work. So. Um, and, and I don't think there is a dichotomy because I think when you do strong, engaging education of young children that's developmentally appropriate, you are taking care of the social emotional thing. If I put a dinosaur in the middle of the room, I'm not gonna have behavioral issues. I'm gonna have a lot of kids playing with a dinosaur. Right? It's gonna be very interesting and intriguing to them. And so all that excitement and joy and the joy of the teacher is gonna get commingled together. Um, we may have to work on executive functioning and self-regulation <laughs> if there was a dinosaur in the room. Um, but 
but the idea of separating out education and care is, you know, for a four-year-old, a three-year-old, they, they don't make those dichotomies. I think it's a historical um, sort of a, uh, between different political compromises we've had to make, but in the end, uh, it'd be very hard to explain to anybody why we make this dichotomy at all. So, I guess. Nancy. You know, economists like to think that, um, like to argue, and would like to persuade all of you that workers are paid basically in proportion to the value they create. And I think there's a certain amount of acceptance of that paradigm when you struggle with this dichotomy between care and education. And you want to say, oh, but really the care is really worth more and it's really being undervalued. Uh, let me just back up a little bit and suggest that people are really not paid according to the value of what they produce. They're, they're paid according to their, their bargaining power, which is very much affected by conditions in the labor market as a whole. And we live in a very segmented labor market where uh, most low-wage workers haven't enjoyed wage increases for the past <laughs> uh, 20 years. Um, there's been a process of technological change and globalization and institutional backtracking that has really disempowered the low-wage market as a whole. So, I mean, I'm really glad Jason used the word union. That word union is really important. It's, that is probably the key determinant of earnings uh, for workers in the public school system and education rather than care. And I think uh, I would like to change the conversation a little bit more towards the issue of bargaining power and away from the issue of, you know, what, what's the value of what people are producing. It's very great. The value of what childcare workers and education workers is very great. But the market does not really have an incentive to recognize it. And that is the <laughs> basic problem. You know, I, um, it's always, Nancy and I had a conversation uh, before this about you know the fact that there that there is a new dialogue about low wage work in in the United States and in many ways I said to Marcy that uh, child care teachers have been like the canary in the coal mines they were paid uh, less long before everybody else's <laughs> wages went down so we're really um, in a in a in a difficult position now on the hopeful side I I do think things are changing when I think of the um, the uh, Department of Labor Statistics and the article that you wrote how many years ago, Deborah? I think Linda Smith is here and can talk about the progress that, that the agency is now making towards changing that. But there's other changes too. I think these, this false dichotomy <laughs> is coming together. Um, if you look at the words in the bill that passed last night, and if for those of us, and Helen's here, that remember what was in the original bill and then what was in the bill in the 90s and Barbara. Um, the word quality was hardly in and child development was hardly in the second version that was reauthorized a few years ago. And now there's a lot of at least words in there <laughs> that the, I think the agency can build on to, um, to bring these worlds together. So I do feel hopeful the financing is the, is the challenge. And let's face it, we need a third party funding stream. I mean, that's what the new campaign has to talk about that's starting today, that we need a third, a third party, you know, that, that is not taking the, not, not the hidden subsidy in child care wages or the lack of ability of parents to pay, not pitting those two things against each other, but bringing in a new, a new funding stream that can, that can take the pressure off parents as well as taking the pressure off providers. That's the hope of the preschool and child care grants. That's the hope of the early head start in child care grants. Even if we didn't get all the way there, that's the right direction. And, and um, so I think, again, it's the financing that we have to continue to focus on. So speaking of funding streams, <coughs> um, this is a question for, for you, Nancy, and it goes to the real, one of the real mysteries in this report. Helene Stubbins asked about it at the other panel, and, and we put off the answer, so maybe you can finally uh, enlighten us here. <laughs> but it's the mystery that, um, at least right now, when we think about funding streams, especially in, in the world of child care, it really is parents, um, and unfortunately, in many cases, who are having to finance uh, this system. And, um, and, and yes, there are many places where we're seeing some, some, some public investment as well, and the pre-K movement is, is a great example of that. But for the most part, it's parents, and, um, and yet we're seeing, so these parents' fees have been almost doubling, and yet pay for those working in these centers has 
barely budged. <coughs> what, what, how do you make any sense of that? What's going on there? I, I don't think it's a puzzle. I think there are two words, market, forces. <laughs> uh, and uh, let, let's just look at them. I mean, we've become more dependent on, on the market and, and conditions in the market, and particularly the labor market, have been very, very bad. Okay, so we know that, we know that uh, subsidies are really inadequate. They're reaching less than 20% of the families that are eligible for them. We know that the subsidies are too low, that they don't actually cover the cost of care that needs to be provided. Uh, we know that subsidies have declined, especially per uh, child in child care, and especially between 2003 and 2009. Uh, so uh, we also know that there's been increased demand for child care, and in particular uh, demand at the high end. So we've seen a big expansion of for-profit care provision. So for-profit revenues in child care have increased by a factor of 10 over the last 20 years. And the for-profit sector is filling a gap, it's meeting some needs, it has a very strong incentive to minimize wage costs, and it can do so very effectively under labor market conditions where there is really high unemployment and st workers are in a very weak fallback position. So again, I think we really need to link the plight of, of child care workers to the plight of low wage workers as a whole and see this as something that uh, minimum wage and collective bargaining policies uh, are going to have to be deployed to address the issue. And, th and there has been certainly that expansion in um, in the for-profit sector. One thing that I found interesting in the report is there also seemed to be a real expansion in the non-profit sector, but private, but but non-profit. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like it just begs these really big questions about those, in those private entities and how they're spending the, the fees that are coming in. Well, and it's in. hard because the whole landscape is institutionally so complex, it's really hard to figure out what is being spent uh, per <coughs> child and what is the subsidy per child and how does the subsidy per child vary yep. according to income. Yep. I think there's a real need for more economic research uh, just on that. That's interesting. And by the way, let me just say, as uh, uh, um, a member of a, the public university system, what's going on is very, very similar to what's happening in public higher ed. People say, why are costs going up? Why is tuition fees? How is this possible? It can't be that much more expensive. Well, it's really simple. Public support has gone down. So it's cost shifting to private families that's driving up the cost of, of tuition and fees. And uh, also in higher ed, you see the growth of a for-profit sector, partly because of the inflexibility and sort of bureaucratic rigidities of, of, of uh, of, of public provision. So it's, it's actually, the two sectors are moving in very similar directions, uh, m much more market-based. So no, we didn't dig on some more questions, but I think, Carol, you wanted yeah, to I reference something. I just wanted something. to say that I, I would love to ha have someone take a, close, a closer mm -hmm. look at this, because I would think that there's some other factors that are in play here. For example, our standards ar around ratios, for example, have changed over these this same period of time, and that conceivably. Ratio of adult to child. Yes, adult explain. child ratios. Um, and that there's a cost factor in that that certainly has absorbed some of this, uh, these dollars. Um, there's a, been a, gr an expansion in infant provi the provision of infant and toddler care as well during this period, which is a more expensive form of care. So I, I just think that while the economic, purely economic analysis could answer some questions. I think we need to look at some of the trends as well that have in affected the delivery of services in centers that are just more costly over the years. But, uh, you know, I think we have to admit that we don't know. And, yes. I, you know, I was glad that Helene asked the question mm -hmm. and we got this question before the report even came out. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to be honest that we, the, the report doesn't necessarily tell us what the answer is. To me, what we have to do is not necessarily get caught up in that, but to keep the focus on the fact that neither the parents or providers are able to make it in the current system and we need new financing. You're going to hear me like a broken record. <laughs> Thank you, John. Jason, I want you to give us the perspective of someone who has worked very hard. It's amazing to see what you guys are doing in the Boston Public Schools. Very hard to not only improve the quality of the teaching in pre-K and in kindergarten um, and, and, and other um, settings all the way up through, but who is looking at how uh, community-based providers can become 
part of that picture. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that's important and then explain maybe some of the, the challenges you might be facing when it comes to um, the, that connection between the, the private market and what the public schools are doing? So um, in the Boston Public Schools, we got about halfway there, meaning we, we are serving about half the children for free in the public schools. Um, the new mayor wants to double that or actually just make preschool universal. Um, and there's been a great push for a lot of reasons to do some of the programming and community-based programs. One is just, uh, you know, the business model of a community-based preschool program is dependent on preschool because infant and toddler you lose money preschool because the ratios are higher you actually have a potential you don't make any money because you're not paid enough by the state but you at least have a chance of making enough to pay your staff so that's the economics of it so along comes the public schools and says okay we're going to do this for free everybody applauds but then it destabilizes community-based programs and so you sort of cut off your nose just to spite your face right <laughs> um, because then your whole infant toddler your preschool your whole system that's set up to lead kids to your schools are, are put at risk. Um, so now we're at a place where, okay, so we're going to use community-based programs, um, and we want to use the same curriculum, the same coaching, the same infrastructure that we set up at the public schools. Um, and you have only 30% of the teachers have bachelor's degrees, let alone maybe 5% have master's degrees. So now um, if we're going to require a master's degree within five years, and we'll say, hey, we're going to pay them, right? Um, and we'll pay them $70,000, and we'll put all that into the cost uh, analysis of this. You have the providers themselves going, wait a minute, um, that's only 30% of my staff have these degrees, and, um, and it's going to take a lot to get them there uh, to a master's degree, and I don't think we can, and the diversification, they're, they're a more diverse workforce, um, and they're from the community, and so we have all of those issues, and so it's like, but you don't want to create a two-tier system where the public schools are offering this free, free program, and then community-based programs are offering a program that has less educated staff, and so it quickly becomes a value conversation. Well, maybe we don't really need degrees, and then it's, you know, so now we're in education field arguing against degrees. <laughs> Um, and I just scratch my head, and, and it's almost impossible to explain or justify that, but I'm telling you I talk to a lot of really smart people who are arguing against degrees. Um, maybe not in the long run. They say, oh, well, let's set it as an aspirational goal. But, you know, you don't want to do this on the backs of students, um, and so you want degree teachers, and we need to figure out how to create pathway, pro uh, pathway programs quickly. Um, and so that's sort of where we're sitting right now is I've gotten them to say, okay, masters, but we really need to, to create strong pathway programs. And so that's one piece of this. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah. No, that's a great segue actually yeah. to, to Carol because I wanted to ask you a little bit more about NAYC and its focus on educational attainment pathways career advancement. Well, we, we continue to do that. Uh, however, we are really happy to see this report come out with a statement about financing because we recognize that in order for um, the workforce to get the compensation um, that is required to improve stability, et cetera, that it's going to, to require a, a, as Joan calls it, a third party uh, finance, financier, uh, financer, funder, <laughs> funding. Um, however, and, and I think that this is something we've known for a long time, but we also know that the profession needs, in order to actually make that work, to leverage that funding, um, the profession needs some tools, and one of the main tools that it can use, I think, is uh, the way in which we define our profession. Uh, something that NAYC is t really taking a, a bold new step forward uh, on. We recently have revised our mission statements and we've developed mission statement and we've developed some um, strategic directions that really land solidly on strengthening uh, advancing a diverse and dynamic early childhood profession. And AYC has always been about high quality services for children. Now we are looking at the profession uh, as a, uh, a partner, if you will, in that um, endeavor. 
So it's part of our mission statement. Strategic goals that uh, have also been established, but that focus squarely on the profession, uh, two specific priorities I, I want to describe. One is getting agreement on the skills, knowledge, competencies, and qualifications used to define the early childhood profession. It's something that we've talked about, we've kind of danced around, we've had various iterations, but now we're prepared to really take a bold step in that direction. Um, and second, defining professional development and preparation systems that support seamless progression from early childhood education professionals, for, for early childhood education professionals to advance their education, professional learning, and careers. And so um, as we work to do, I think one of the things that, that Miriam uh, identified is the fact that th there's a shaky foundation mm -hmm. for our system. We are really talking about building uh, infrastructure that keeps, that solidifies that foundation. Um, there are a number of things NAYC will be doing, certainly to continue its focus on credentials and standards for teachers and standards for the settings in which teachers work. But we want to underscore the fundamental or foundational belief that there's an interaction between teacher preparation and workforce quality. If teachers are well prepared, if they get into workplaces where there's not high quality infrastructure, if you will, they can't exercise the preparation um, that they bring to it. So we will continue to focus on that and that interaction. Um, we also are going to do some things to educate the workforce, workforce on the wages and compensation, compensation status of the profession. Uh, thus, this report is very useful and very timely for us. Um, we have gotten a four-year grant from the Kellogg Foundation to really work squarely in this arena, um, working to help uh, caregivers, educators, early care and education professionals become better advocates for the structural incentives um, for improved compensation through policy and policy change at the federal and state levels. We'll be doing some education around that. Um, as well as working to improve public perception of the workforce as a s trained and skilled body of workers. So that's pretty much where we are. It's a lot. A lot it's of work. A lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, work. But it's exciting to know and that an AOIC is moving forward on this and the, and the Kellogg grant um, alone yes. is an exciting moment, um, an infusion of new resources for the, for the field. Um, I want to actually stay on this idea of a third, uh, third party funding stream or the, the Im just important recommendation I just want to lift up that's at the beginning of this report that we really do need to identify and mobilize a dedicated source of public f funding to, to propel this kind of quality. Um, and I want to put that alongside the other finding from the report that really stuck out for me and get your take on this, Nancy, that the the amount of public support that our country is paying for to um, allow the, um, the, these uh, teachers to be able to pay, put food on the table for their children, that's costing our country about $2.4 billion a year. Um, that is how much of public support they're having to dip into. What does that tell you? And, um, and I'm interested in the context of the uh, just broader problem of low-wage workers in this country and what it's costing our society in terms of our ability, our requirement to kind of be paying public benefits. Well, again, I think what you're seeing is a overall shift in the in the global economy where less skilled and less educated workers around the world have been increasingly disempowered and are facing declining real wages. Um, and one of the consequences of that is a need for increased wage subsidies. And I think uh, the earned income tax credit, which is a policy that 
many of us have supported for many years for very good reasons and is in, in many respects a good policy, but it has a, uh, uh, a kind of unfortunate side mm -hmm. effect that namely as a federal wage subsidy basically it makes it possible for employers mm -hmm. to pay less. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why the minimum wage campaign and efforts for minimum wage and living <coughs> wage campaigns are, are so important, is that they are uh, based on the idea that uh, employers and consumers should be paying the true cost of production, not, not taxpayers. So I, I think, uh, to me, this is an issue where child care workers need to work in alliance with, with other, mm -hmm. other low-wage workers. And I think, I, I know there's some strategic advantages to singling them out, and I do think they are a distinctive group, uh, but I also think they have a lot in common with mm -hmm. other workers in the care sector in particular yeah. who are not unionized, and that there should be some thinking about building a coordinated uh, care worker, care sector strategy. A, a really good example of a group that's not being mentioned here today, but which is in very similar circumstances are home care workers yeah. who are caring for the elderly in their own homes, who are also predominantly women of color, um, and are, are very, a very poor, poorly regulated and increasingly private pay oriented uh, market. So. so yeah, I know that several of you want to make a comment on this and let's do that and then we'll start getting your questions ready and we'll, we'll go to those out there as well. Um, Jason, go ahead. I'll defer to Joan. In a <laughs> well, you know, I just building on Carol and Nancy's comments, I think that it's exciting to hear that we're going to try to make these jobs less invisible because right now they're you know, you talk about teachers in America and you don't think about this part of the teaching workforce. And so, you know, it's very exciting to hear that there are going to be new efforts to make them visible. You know, I want to start here talking about these as the jobs of the future for America. I mean, these are the jobs, I always say this, they're not going to ship overseas. These are jobs that are here to say, stay. And I do think linking it with elder care, I uh, am dealing with elder care right now um, in my own family, and I've been amazed at the similarities across the elder care, child care continuum. So I think we've got to become more integrated into the jobs movement, make the jobs more visible, and um, begin to ratchet up the uh, the, the level of attention to this part of the teaching workforce. So um, I guess I have a really different take. Um, I think we should embrace the public schools. I think that early education and care should just become early education. Um, I think it should become, funding should go to public school districts to oversee birth to five, birth to eight. Um, because I think the public funds education. I think that the science tells us that we are leaving academic trajectories up to chance um, and that we really can do a lot to make a difference uh, in kids' lives and that it needs to be publicly funded. And so I don't think we'll get much traction unless we connect to the education world and redefine what education is. And trust me, sitting in a public school, I know how unprepared it is to deal with early education, um, including engaging families, but I think that is our best chance to kind of redefine the playing field for this field. Yeah. You know, I just want to be clear, obviously we all have been trying to bring these two worlds together, but I can tell you a preschool program for three hours a day is not going to be what my daughter needs when she's going to work. So. We've got to look at both sides of this and bring these pictures together in a way that I think the public school system has not yet been able to do for working families. And that maybe there's a, a, a spectrum of, of care, um, uh, if, that's what, if that's what you mean, Joan. Yeah. But, and, and Jason, your point um, brings me to kind of what I was thinking about when I was writing that first question about that dichotomy between care and education. Because if we're seeing that it's not obviously just calling them preschool teachers. There's something kind of different about the way they've identified. Um, but if in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the preschool teachers are the ones who've seen some, some wage growth, um, then is that a signal that um, considering this teaching is an important step toward more pay parity? It is teaching. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's yes. I mean, I just, I think we need to redefine public schooling zero to eight. Um, and so I just, I mean, 
I, you cannot just put a kid on a bus for two hours and call that after school, which is what the public schools do. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, it, it, obviously, you know, and the thing is you will be so much more successful if actually you greet families and bring them in and that public schools do play to learn groups. And I just think the consequences of not making this public is a two-tier system. So we're seeing you know, low-income kids, putting low-income at-risk children in a group with other low-income at-risk children decreases vocabulary, decreases the pay of teachers, letting sort of the people who have means pay their teachers and supplement it with after-school programs and sports and all sorts of wonderful and interesting things is, is a, a two-pathway two academic trajectory. And so what we have found that in the mixed income public school programs, which are free and attractive to everybody, we're seeing peer effects. So I think we do not want to make it dependent on market forces. I think we need to take control of this and define what education is and redefine what public education looks like. So, so I, um, I want to start getting some questions um, from the audience and we'll have about 10 minutes for questions here. But as um, we're collecting those, if you all could think, um, maybe this is a little unfair to put two requests on you at once, but in responding to the questions, if you could also think about what gives you hope. That same question that we had at the end of the last panel um, so that we can leave feeling like there are some, some really strong paths forward. Okay, so let's take a first question. Um, I see a woman there with their and please just uh, state your name and affiliation and just quickly get to your question. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Emily Dropkin. I'm with the National Head Start Association. Um, in the Head Start workforce, we have a quarter of our staff who began as Head Start parents and who are often cultivated so that our workforce reflects the diversity in terms of language and ethnicity um, and uh, linguistic background of the children that we work with. Um, and so as we continue to pay these families poverty wages, even as they're trying to achieve stability through the Head Start program. Um, obviously, that's a, an issue that plays into what we've heard today. But how do we continue to preserve that value of diversity, especially in terms of having the role models for children reflect their own characteristics, um, but also um, be successful and well-educated and well-compensated? I'd like to respond Yes, please, Carol. Well, we just have to be intentional about it. Um, we have, and we have some great examples out there, like the TEACH uh, scholarship program that really takes the, um, that takes people where they start and structures their experiences to support them to get to really the highest levels of, of formal education in the field. Um, and I raise that partly because we have this report now that says, you know, globally, um, getting more education doesn't make a difference in your salaries and wages. And yet, we know that the experience of people within the field, as documented by the TEACH program, is, is different from that. At, at the same time, this may be true globally for us, getting more formal education does lead to salary increases. They are small and not, uh, they're important to the people who, who get them. They, and they uh, contribute to stability uh, in, in, of the workforce. So that, you know, this is another one of those tension points um, in the field. We have to be very vigilant about how we message this and really what the, the experiences of individuals are. When you talk about public schools, for example, that's another diversity flashpoint because the early care and education workforce is very diverse culturally and racially and linguistically. More diverse than the public school, public sector, public school workforce. Will that, and that will, change as we embrace public schools as a funder unless we do some things to make sure that it does not change for the caregivers or the educators of our youngest children in communities because that's what their parents want. I, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I, I do, I really agree it's important to increase educational credentials. I, I just want you to think about it in terms of supply and demand. If all you do is increase the supply, that is probably not going to have much effect. 
what you need to do is increase the demand for the credentials by setting higher standards for them, okay? But more importantly, and this is what going outside or away from market forces means, you need to think about the relationship between supply and demand rather than just assuming that it's all gonna play out. And concretely, in terms of something like Head Start, this means like setting new standards and then building in on-the-job training and credentials that, can, that, that, that make it easier for people uh, to attain those credentials in conjunction with working in on the job to bring that supply and demand together. So that's an alternative to just thinking about just relying on the market. Mm -hmm. But it's still very consistent with the idea that we need to press for uh, greater investment in, in, in education and credentials. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I really am happy to hear the Head Start Association here because really if you look back to 1990 when this report came out, it was the debate around uh, the 1990 reauthorization and the fact that compensation was put and uh, benchmarks were put, began, began to emerge during that period that led the field in many ways. We've had this situation where it's been no credential or a BA. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think yeah, we are crazy. moving towards something different and the debate about Head Start, whether Head Start should have degrees and what percentage of classrooms should have degrees. What I think many of us uh, argued for was some time so that you're not, so you're bringing the people from, from uh, you know, that ha may not have had traditional BAs into the process. So you keep the diversity of the workforce. That was a very important principle. And, you know, we're at a point now where we all are very anxious to have you know, higher credentials, but we're gonna have to do it, it with a process that allows people to move up and give them the time and the resources to do that. And we haven't provided the reason. We required, you know, the BA degrees in a certain percentage of the classrooms, but we didn't provide enough money for them to get them. Jason, you wanted to respond. So, I, 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 I think we really, really have to spend a lot of time on pathway programs um, and really and resources and figure out how to do it well. But I want everybody to feel a sense of urgency. Yeah. Every year we don't do this. There's a 30% difference in the kids who go through our K-1 experience, our pre-K experience, then go to any other pre-K experience um, and, and that's in community-based and Head Start. Difference in their achievement. And it is on the achievement and their third grade MCAS scores, which is our comprehensive. It's a huge difference. And that trajectory is, is a whole lifetime. So while, while we are talking about values, we are really talking about academic trajectories. And so I just hope that if we're going to do this, we need to do it fast and we need to do it well. But we shouldn't do it on the backs of students. Let's go to a couple more questions here. That um, one in white in the back. Thanks, uh, Sean Griffin, Collaborative Communications. Um, I'm really lucky because I get to work at the intersection of finance, sustainability, policy, and communication. So I've enjoyed <laughs> this uh, panel very much. Jason and Joan, you answered one of my questions, which is the strategy of embedding pre-K as part of the uniform student per pupil funding formula. We just refigured that here in DC a year ago. Um, very, it was just an accepted way of, of operation. I have another question about a strategy which um, kind of came up. Social innovation funding and creating opportunity compacts to look at taking advantage of um, or, or turning around some of those benefits that low-wage workers need to access to be able to, uh, to live and, and have economic success. Uh, you know, what about sort of plowing some of that back into some programs to increase wages on the front end? I'm not sure to that. Say more about what you're, are you talking about social opportunity bonds, like giving the private sector a, a chance to show that they can. Social opportunity bonds, uh, social impact funding, opportunity contacts, they're all sort of different names of the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this is why the market doesn't work very well there. The market works great if you know exactly what the value of the output is. It's really great. You know, like you put a dollar fifty cents in a Coke machine, you get a Coke, you know what you're going to get. Okay, so that is great. That is a great exchange. You, the reason why it's so hard with children to use the market is you don't know for 50 goddamn years <laughs> what, the, what the payoff is, right? And okay, yes, I, okay, I'm, in I'm a social scientist. I like to measure. You know, I think uh, test scores are very interesting. But, you know, the idea that you can actually totally quantify and then use quality measures to make markets work you know, well, oh yeah, do that in the family too. Yeah, so give parents more money if their kids do better raising their kids. I mean, you would never, you would never, this is why we have non-market institutions, right? This is why the market isn't everything. And yet we seem to live in a world where we think, oh, if we just moved into the market, it would be much more efficient. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> On that note, I want to um, just take a, a moderator's prerogative maybe to ask the, the last question um, and just feel free to answer it uh, quickly here. Um, but I, I think about my own kids. I have two girls, and they're growing up, and their world is their oyster. I mean, they, there's all sorts of careers they can go into. Um, and I want them to see the amazing kind of scientific and engineering work that goes into teaching young children so that they recognize that as an in incredibly enriching career option. Um, but I am uh, unable, kind of, as a parent who also wants to make sure that they can pay their rent, um, to right now uh, highly encourage this. And it makes me incredibly sad. So I um, wondered if you might be able to comment on just kind of try to look forward. So my kids, I got about 10 years till they're in college. In 10 years, will we have a place where a, an entering freshman in college could say, yes, that is the career I want to take, and, and, um, and what's, what is it going to take to get us there? Okay, I'll, I'll do go it for the girls. No. Yes, Lisa, don't, do not worry. We got this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got this. Yes, and... We got this. We got this because we have the Leah Austins and the Marion Calderones, and we have the young people who are in policy positions who understand these issues in ways that we certainly didn't when this report came out 25 years ago. Uh, they understand it. They know each other. They know we have to work together, and they are going to get some traction on this issue for the field in the next 10 years. Done. Awesome. Done. Okay, so if you go to our website and just do BPS Early Childhood Weebly, who cares about Weebly, just do BPS Early Childhood <laughs> and it'll come out on Google. You will see um, the beauty of early childhood education and video. So you're going to see Vivian Paley's storytelling with, um, w done at the Children's Museum with 100 families going, oh my God, these kids are amazing. You're going to see teachers dissecting kids using primary colors and then going out in the neighborhood and doing Reggio Emilia stuff where then they come back and there's a group, uh, a, a family dinner at the end of it by the whole preschool program. You're going to see incredible drawings. So you're going to see the intricacy and the beauty of what you can do to show the learning because that's what we really do need to do. Um, they can also, in 10 years, come work in the Boston Public Schools uh, because they will get paid $70,000 um, or more, right, by then, right, because the union has created a, a, a place for them. Um, and so I do think that um, I hope that public school education is redefined and that four-year-olds are, uh, we are required to serve all four-year-olds in the public schools. It may be in a community-based setting. It may be in a family child care provider's home, right? It may be, right? But probably community-based setting and Head Start. But I hope that that's where we grow to and that we've thought through parental leave and we've thought through a lot of these systems that need to be in place. Um, but we're going to have to change a lot of policy along the way. But I do think that we, we have to intentionally really think through this public school issue and public education and where we fit in it. I, I deal with this, you know, every day with my students because they're, they all are, all, you know, they're asking this question. And I just tell them what I think is true, which is that if you choose a job 
that involves caring for other people, you're going to pay a penalty in terms of earnings over your lifetime. But you're also going to capture a really important reward in terms of intrinsic satisfaction and contribution to your, your community. And what you need to be thinking about is how to design institutional changes that can allow uh, people who do good uh, to be better paid. And I think in 10 years, actually, that uh, my students will have made some progress in that direction. I have a lot of confidence in there. Well, I, you know me, I'm always optimistic. And I, you know, I don't know if it's 10 years, but I, I, I would say that in the 45-year journey that many of us have been on, we have seen changes. There are signs of hope, I think, listening to Jason. Um, we know now that learning begins at birth, and I think that that notion is getting through to people. So, you know, we've got people who, something must be with this field. There are hedge fund managers who, like, find the light and then decide they want to do caring jobs. So there's something in this that I think is right, and I think Anne starting that way this morning was really perfect. So, you know, I think the most important lesson from today is this is a new day. This is the day after, and it is day one of a campaign to really have a national dialogue in the next few years about public funding for the early childhood field, and that should be our clarion call. The final word, Joan, thank you. Thanks to everybody on the panel. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to the authors of the report, Marcy Debrank and Carolee. All right.